What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. He is Andrew Destin. I am Noah Hiles. We are your Pirates beat writers for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Two guys in charge of documenting the season of a team that is now off to a six and one start. Andrew, really impressive stuff. Before we dive into anything, just want to get your initial takeaways from this Washington National Series. Another series victory for the Pirates. Yeah, another series victory, another one away from home too, right? All of this yeah. coming before the home opener against the Baltimore Orioles. Um, my biggest takeaway personally is just that um, this is a sneaky Nationals team. Obviously, last year they struggled in a lot of ways. This has been a team that's been mired in a rebuild. But you look up and down the lineup and some of the pitchers that the Pirates had to face in this three-game set. I mean, Mackenzie Gore and Josiah Gray, these are two guys that are by no means any slouches. And obviously, Trevor Williams, Pirates fans are familiar with him, a crafty right-hander who can meander his way through any lineup, really. Um, Gore is a power lefty arm. Uh, Gray was an all-star last year. Williams was the guy that the Pirates struggled with the most. So I look at it and I say, yeah, I mean, the Marlins, they, in theory, were supposed to have a really good rotation. We've obviously seen how that has been problematic through the early part of the season. I look at this Pirates team and say that lineup stood the test of a more strenuous challenge, I think, in two of the best three pitchers um, that the Nationals have. And then, you know, being able to persevere through some adverse conditions just in, you know, a weather delay today, obviously being suboptimal for Mitch Keller's start. So it's April baseball, but the Pirates still earned a series win and got two out of three. And that's all you can ask for. We're going to break down the good, bad, and ugly from this series uh, win and also talk a little bit about the upcoming series against the Baltimore Orioles. But before we do all of that, we've got to talk about our show's presenting sponsor, which is the North Shore Tavern. We're brought to you, as always, by the North Shore Tavern. If you love baseball, then you'll love the North Shore Tavern. The interior wall is all pirates, wall to wall. There are appetizers, entrees, cocktails, and, of course, a steak on the stone or sta- seafood on a st- sizzling lava stone. Open every day in the North Shore Tavern is right across the street from PNC Park, and it's Pittsburgh's home of Steak on a Stone. I was just there today. Great spot. Can't can't talk enough about it. And uh, I think a lot of Pirate fans will be there over the weekend for this uh, first home series. But before we get into that, Andrew, we got to reflect on the series victory for the Pirates in D.C. Uh, we got a good, bad, and ugly. I'll let you start. What's your good? What's What's the best thing that you took away from this series victory? Yeah, there's a lot that I could take away, and I think the one that stands out to me, and this is for both on and off the field baseball reasons, was Michael A. Taylor coming back to uh, Washington, D.C. This is where he spent the first seven years of his career. He was drafted by the Nationals back in 2009 and hadn't played at Nationals Park since September 27th of 2020. And as you guys listening and watching know, uh, fans weren't allowed at ballparks back in 2020. So this is the first time he got to come back, and the fans gave him a standing ovation, You know, tipped the cap, all that sort of stuff. And then he went out there and played as good of a series as you can ask of a center fielder, let alone an eight or nine hitter, went seven for 12, drove in three runs, had a double today during uh, during Thursday's game. What an acquisition that's looking like early going. I know you tweeted as much and I couldn't agree right. more. It's that this guy has done exactly what you could have asked of your center fielder and more. What a series for Michael and Taylor and what a moment for him that I know that he appreciated. Yeah, and and – you know, I when they made the move, I was a big fan of it, just in the sense where it's – and it had nothing to do with his offense. I, I, I thought if the guy could have an OPS plus of just 100, be standard average, which is basically what he's been offensively for the bulk of his career, I thought this is just still a huge addition because the defense is so good. And it makes Jack Sawinski a guy who's – also a solid outfielder, your third outfielder, and then you have Oliveris and, and Joe as your platoon players. I mean, that's a really good outfield. But, I mean, I know we're six, seven games in, but the guy's hitting close to 500. He's setting the table for a really good top of the order. So there's a lot to like so far with Michael Taylor. Um, I'm going to go with another guy. You, you talk about top of the order. Connor Joe has continued to, I think, Ben, probably right behind Michael Taylor, Probably been the second best player for this team, it, you know, day in and day out throughout these first seven games. I mean, you could argue, I mean, Cabrian's been good. Brian Reynolds has been good. Rowdy Telez has had some big time, you know, clutch hits. Uh, but I mean, Connor Joe, in those first five games against leadoff or as the leadoff hitter, he was setting the table every game. Uh, he's getting on with walks. He's hitting doubles. He had his first home run today. Um, he's just been great. And, and the defense is, is, is solid too. I mean, he's made plays at first. He's fine in the outfield. You can kind of move him around in the lineup. And I think as the season goes on, 
there should be maybe a conversation. Is is he just a platoon player? If he keeps playing like this, I mean, the guy, I'm pretty sure he had a home run off of a righty today. Uh, he's yeah. got other hits off of righties too. So, I mean, he's having a really good season. That would be my good. Uh, we're getting to bad now, Andrew. I'll let you start this one off. What's your bad? Yeah, Pirates fans won't like this one, but Henry Davis. And I know he's a polarizing guy for a lot of reasons, being a former number one overall pick. And I know everybody wants to talk about the defense and how has he come along as a defensive catcher. Frankly, for me, I, you know, I found him to be adequate this series. You know, yeah. I thought he did a fine job receiving. There were some strikes that he lost. Um, he did a good job of throwing down a third on one play and a bunt play. Um, but unfortunately, the hitting just hasn't been there uh, through the early stages of the season. And that culminated in a hat trick today, striking out three times. He did have a two-hit, two-double day against the Nationals in the first game of the series, but all told, uh, two for 12. And now when you look at it, he's four for 24 on the season. So not a great start for Hank. That's something that you got to monitor. And I think part of that, too, is, and I know we'll get into this more in the next segment, is you got to make sure you're getting the guy some days off. Um, he's gotten a lot of time already behind the dish. That's been necessitated by, obviously, the lack of catching depth. So Henry is a guy to monitor. And obviously, just given what they expect of him and what he's capable of hitting, probably need to see more out of Henry moving forward. Not only is he making a lot of outs, but he's making a lot of outs with guys on the bases. And yeah. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it feels like at least once a game, he, he's stranding runners in scoring position. And when you're going to bat a guy in the middle of the order like that, who is, let's be real, I mean, he was drafted for his bat. Like, you, yeah. you drafted him first overall to be a guy who can drive in those runs. And luckily for the Pirates, they've had other guys drive in those runs that he left stranded. But, yeah, not a great start to the year from him. Uh, and I'll say the other bad is Mitch Keller. Uh, I don't think as bad as Henry Davis has been, uh, you know, per se, in the beginning of this year. But, I mean, he's probably, aside from Bailey Falter, probably been their worst starting pitcher so far this season. Um you know, the big inning has got to him in, in both of his starts, and that's that's a concern. I'm not going to sit here and, and worry too much about Mitch Keller right now, uh, but I think, you know, his next start, which would be in the Detroit series, I believe, mm -hmm. um, if he gets shelled there, if he can't get through six there, maybe you do get a little concerned because, I mean, the spring was the spring. Uh, you, you can't really overanalyze it, but there were times in the spring where the velocity wasn't great. Right. And now you're coming out here and he's not looking great. And again, it's two starts in. Am I worried about Mitch Keller? No. But if I had to pick something that hasn't been great so far, if, when you're talking about a team that has only lost once in seven games, you got to kind of get nitpicky and you got to go after the starter who, again, hasn't been amazing. He hasn't been horrible, but the Pirates are going to need him to be a lot better. And he's even admitted that much. So uh, we'll go under the ugly now. Um, Andrew, again, I, you kind of hinted at it with your point, but it, there's there's a blaring ugly on this roster right now. Yeah, it's catching depth. And we saw the Pirates as recently as I believe that was Wednesday. I lose track of days, but um, went out and acquired Joey Bart, who, you know, as Pirates fans now know through reading Noah and I's coverage of that trade um, and him coming aboard here to Pittsburgh. Um, he's a guy who, frankly, you know, if you want to label him anything from his time with the San Francisco Giants, it was that he was a bust. Um, this was yeah. a guy who was a number two overall pick back in 2018, um, had an exemplary career collegiately at Georgia Tech, and then never quite put it together trying to follow in the shadows of Buster Posey, and then ultimately got replaced by Patrick Bailey. I bring him up because the Pirates needed to go out and get Joey Bart, because Jason DeLay is now on the I.L., Yasmani Grandal. I mean, we heard Derek Shelton say as much on Wednesday that this is a guy who's still a ways away from coming back. He's with the team, but he has just started a running progression. I imagine he's probably still at least a few weeks, if not more, away from even beginning a rehab assignment. So that's obviously something that's concerning, given that they brought in Yasmani Grandal on that one-year contract back in free agency. So the ugly right now is that if Henry Davis isn't able to stick as that everyday catcher, which I'm not here to speculate whether he will or won't, it's more the matter of the fact is they went out and got Bart because they need help. Because right now there is not a lot there, not to mention Andy Rodriguez, of course, who last year kind of became that everyday catcher. He's up for the year because he has a right UCL surgery back in December. So there's not a lot there in terms of catching. And Ali Sanchez is elected free agency recently. Right. So there's not a whole lot there. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've got five guys on their 40-man roster that play catcher. And three of them are currently on the IL. And, Andrew, I wouldn't be shocked if multiple guys in that IL category were end up on the 60-day. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the way we're looking right now. And, again, that's 
that's just speculating here. I'm not saying anything that we've heard or whatever, but it's just the way things are trending. I mean, Grandal, like like you said, I mean, it doesn't seem like he's anywhere close to being ready. And uh, just based on the comments that Shelton made, uh, delays thing has been lingering and it's going to take some time for him too. So yeah, Joey, Joey Bart is somebody, uh, that the pirates need to be solid. I think because it, it takes, if he can come in here and just be a, a productive above average backup, that takes a lot of weight off of Henry Davis's shoulders. And, and, and I understand that Henry Davis should have pressure on him. He's the top overall pick. This is what you draft him for. He still is a guy who's very young and playing his first full big league season. And normally a guy in his spot has some sort of veteran. And and maybe Joey Bart can be a guy that can connect with him, you know, and say like, hey, I know what it's like to be a high-end catcher draft pick yeah. who was a stud in college. In the ACC, for that matter. So, yeah. Um, my, my ugly is going to be something non-related to the baseball team. It's going to be the weather. Um, Andrew, you've been away. Half the city is seemingly underwater right now. Uh, if yeah. You, yeah, I talked about it on the KDK, on KDK TV. Um, I'm a weather correspondent now in addition to a Pirates beat reporter and a fan, according to them, uh, on one graphic. But, um, yeah, it's it's going to be a very interesting opening day because while you were gone, yeah, there's there's a lot of – there's the whole river walks underwater. There's some roads still closed because they're – covered in water right now. Um, and so the home opener is going to be logistically tough, I think, for fans. Uh, I think it's going to create a little bit more of a ruckus atmosphere outside the ballpark. I also am curious to see how things go weather-wise for the actual games, Andrew. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if there were some weather delays. And you're talking to a guy who has been to the last 20 Pirates home openers. Not one has ever been rain delayed. Like there's been snow, there's been a little bit of a drizzle, there's been nice weather for some, but I've never seen one ever get delayed. So aside from the one with COVID, of course. Um, so that'll be interesting. Uh, but it's it's ugly weather right now here in the 412, and I hope it doesn't delay your flight because we've got a lot of coverage plans and that would screw things up for the both of us. Uh, so before we wrap things up, uh, we, we just recap the national series. Pirates take two or three in D.C. A big series coming up. Um, just this is a, to me, this is a real test here. Like the Marlins with all their injuries. I know they're a playoff team last year. They're probably not going to be that great of a ball club this year. And, and like you said in the beginning, Andrew, the Nationals are in the middle of a rebuild, not even in the middle. They're still probably in the earlier phases of a rebuild. They're, they're, they're kind of trying to lose right now. Yeah. Um, the Orioles are not. The Orioles are really good. They're a loaded team. One through nine in the batting order. They've got great pitching. They're a team that won 100 games last year. They're a team that some people think could win the World Series this year. So similar to, I believe, last year, uh, the Pirates had some early challenges. I think they had a series against Houston early in their homestand. They, they played um, some other good teams. This is a challenge. This is a lot different of a caliber of opponent, and we'll see how they play. What's one key thing you have your eye on for this first home series? Yeah, I'm curious to see how the hitting does against this trio of pitchers that they'll see from the Orioles. And I know that, you know, the hitting is obviously very important with Baltimore. There's a lot of guys that we can pinpoint. But you look at the way that they start off. They're going up against Grayson Rodriguez, a guy who last year in the second half had a sub 2.5 ERA. Tyler Wells, uh, you know, double-digit winner guy last year as a starter. Dean Kremer, another solid starter for them. Don't underestimate this rotation, and I think this will be the stiffest challenge yet in terms of starters um, that this Pirates team faces so far from the Orioles. It's not going to be easy, obviously, to keep that offense at bay, but I'm curious to see how this offense does in terms of generating runs relative to the way they did in the first seven games, especially starting off against Rodriguez, a guy who really came into his own in the second half. Yeah, I'll do, I'll go with the flip here. Um, I, I, I that's My thing is, how are they going to prevent the Orioles from scoring runs? I mean, this is, a, this is a loaded lineup, one through nine. Right. And the starting pitching for the Pittsburgh Pirates needs to, to, to come to play. Uh, you, you know, you talked about how the how are the Pirates going to generate runs. I need to know also how are they going to prevent the opposition from scoring runs? Uh, because I, I think that Jared Jones, I mean, he looked really good in his first start. The hitters he's going to see in start number two are a lot better. Um, and Marco Gonzalez and Bailey Falter, the other two guys scheduled to pitch, I believe. Is that right? In this mm -hmm. too? 
Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, th- these are these are three really tough matchups for the Pirates. And and if they're able to generate offense and their starting pitching can do enough to get the game to the bullpen, which I think will do well just about against pretty much any team. Uh, but if they can get the, the bullpen, the baseball with this game still competitive and not allow an ugly inning or an ugly couple of innings against this loaded birds lineup, then they should be in good shape. But that's easier said than done. Uh, Andrew, we'll, we'll wrap it up with a prediction. How many wins? There's five games in this upcoming homestand. How many wins do the Pirates leave with? I would like to think three. I think that they probably take one from the Orioles. Um, and I think that I think don't think it's you know too much to say that they take both from Detroit. Um, obviously, this Tigers team is one that's you know very different than say a couple of years back. But um, yeah, I'll go ahead and say three and two. I think that they drop the home opener. Unfortunately, apologies, Pirates fans. You can come at me with your pitchforks, but. Um, it's just a matter of which game they take between the Saturday and the Sunday. And then I think they go into that second big road trip of the year with going to Philadelphia and New York with some momentum and playing better. Uh, especially I'll say that another note to make there is just the night game into the day game for a two game set always favors the home team. So I'm looking at the pirates doing pretty well in that two game set and at least taking one from Baltimore. How about you? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go the same. I think three and two, um, I'm not sure which ones they'll win, which ones they'll lose, because there's been a lot of times even early in the season where I thought they were going to lose mid game and they didn't. So, uh, but I, I think that they, um, I think they'll probably split with Detroit and, and I think they will win this Baltimore series. So I'll get a little bit more specific. I don't know. I, I'd like to see them win the home opener just because I know that's something that makes our readers happy, but that's about it. Uh, so that's all we got for this one. Follow our coverage. We've got a lot of fun stuff planned for the home opener and just for the season in general. You can read all of our work at post-gazette.com. You can check out all of our Pittsburgh sports analysis on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. He's Andrew Destin. I'm Noah Hiles. This show is brought to you by the North Shore Tavern. We will see you tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon, I should say, at PNC Park. Take care. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.